I'll just wait as people drop into the meeting. Okay, well, welcome everyone and um, thank you for attending this special MANA webinar for the University of New England. Um, we do hold monthly webinars um, that are usually across um, all of our partners, but today we really wanted to focus in on UNE for um, World Mental Health Day, where the theme is um, a mentally healthy workplace. So I want to start by acknowledging country and um, to do so and think about the way in which the custodians of this land have, through their oral history, really created safe and secure places of being, places of working and coming together and community through an oral history that tells us how to, to work well together, to be together and to respect each other. Um, across different cultural groups, across different lands, and to acknowledge um, and to truly acknowledge um, that deep history that we have in this country and to think about the ways in which we can learn and grow going forth in relation to how we um, create mentally healthy spaces that we're all in um, in our different parts of our lives. I'd also like to acknowledge um, any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us today um, and to the contribution that our First Nations working group have to Manor Institute and also to um, the broader run group as they continue to grow and shape um, the ways in which we work um, as allies to create a mentally healthy spaces in which we all operate regardless of our discipline background or the roles that we play at the University of New England. So today marks World Mental Health Day um, and today, um, as I said, the theme is uh, mentally healthy workplaces and it's particularly poignant, I think, given the new psychosocial legislation that, it, that all workplaces in Australia um, must meet. But also to acknowledge that 65% of the Australian population is of working age. So workplaces are a really key place in which people experience mental health, but also um, distress that might be caused in the workplace or from any other part of life, whether it be um, somebody themselves struggling with their mental health, supporting a child or somebody else in their life who's struggling with their mental health. But also as points of transition, and we know that these are really important parts of mental ill health. So young people um, have massively increasing um, levels of distress, and particularly since COVID. And so we obviously house a lot of young people coming into university. And so the way in which we also think about our students in this workplace um, in relation to their mental health and wellbeing and how we might be able to ensure that we're providing the right sort of support and caring environment, um, both to avert any sort of distress, but also um, help people through uh, a help seeking journey to the sorts of support that they might need. So today's um, webinar really is to uh, allow a point for us all to hear from the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Research, Chris Armstrong, around the new research enterprise and engagement plan um, and the four flagship research areas. But it's also, given that it's World Mental Health Day, a time for people who are doing mental health research to really consider the way that we're doing our research in mental health and wellbeing and how that relates to our new four flagship areas. As the Director of Manor Institute, I find this a really exciting time for UNE to be able to galvanise around four different areas that all intersect with the, the ways in which we do research at UNE, which is in community embedded, looking for solutions to particular issues for regional Australians, um, as well as obviously more broader um, nationally and internationally. So in addition to um, Professor Armstrong, we have a lovely panel um, that are made up of people who are affiliated with Manor Institute um, through different roles and different ways um, of their research and teaching. And we're going to walk through a number of questions with each of our panellists um, to really explore these um, ways in which we can think about our mental health and, and wellbeing research in relation to the research enterprise and engagement plan. So the way that we're going to um, do this webinar is um, Chris will talk first for around five minutes about the um, Enterprise and Engagement Plan. Some of you will have attended 
his session maybe a couple of weeks ago um, where um, this was introduced to the broader staff, others who have been um, engaged in the um, in uh, different research committees may have seen um, earlier drafts and commented on it. But to really sort of set the scene, we're going to ask Chris to, um, to talk through the four flagship areas and then we'll walk, walk through each of the panellists um, around those topic areas. And so don't worry, panellists, I will remind you of um, the topic areas um, that we want you to cover as we come to each of you. Um, but I'll hand first to Chris Armstrong to talk through um, our flagship areas. Thanks, Chris. Um, maybe I'll... I'll talk a bit about flagships, um, hoping hoping that people can hear me. I've got a um, bit of an unstable connection and a lawnmower in the background. Um, um, but I'll also just give you a bit of a flavour of the overall plan as well. Um, and then I'll go into a bit more depth on the flagship. So the plan is being developed over the last many months. Um, as, as Miff mentioned, some of you will have um, seen the Forum a few weeks ago talking through the plan, but really there are a number of different initiatives in the plan. Um, some initiatives about building collaboration, improving research infrastructure at the university, supporting a research culture, um, improving um, culture for earlier mid-career researchers, um, supporting grant um, ap application activities and our HDRs. A few initiatives well we're doing in research at the university uh, and and looking at any risks that we might have like key person risks or how do we manage research in a safe way and compliant way um, some initiatives around indigenous researchers and and also um, initiatives around how do we better have systems that enable our researchers to um, work with external organizations and end users and so it's a it's a plan that's really is in the broadest sense of the word. So res academic researchers, professional staff, and technical staff working in research, and students as well. But also importantly, how does research then feed into teaching, learning at the university? Um, a key part of the of the plan is is the conceptualization of a set of flagship areas. So the kind of the way I was we think we as a community or a society are faced with a number of really big trends or mega trends. Some people heard them referred to. So things that are really driving the way that society is moving. Um, we think about climate change. We think about health. Uh, we think about digital technology. So what we've done in the research plan is, is develop a set of four sort of overarching flagships that really are, become an organising principle at the university and outside of the university can collaborate together and work together on some really big, challenging, difficult problem domains. But the domains that we've that are in these flagships are ones that we have strength here at the university, historical strength, um, and a lot of work going on across all three faculties. So I'll just talk through um, the four flagships. I'm lucky. Um, that I know about MANA because I've been working with with MIF and the and the team on MANA Institute since the first week I arrived at the university, um, which I think is two years ago today even. Um, so the, there's one flagship which is about One Health, and what what we mean by One Health is particularly about how human health overlaps with environmental health and overlaps with agricultural health. So in that domain could be things such as zoonotic diseases. We've all lived through a COVID pandemic. We know about Hendra virus where, where viruses move from animals to humans. That's kind of their one health concerns, but also issues around mental health that might be triggered by environmental factors is another one health concern. Um, that could be um, whether it's about people that um, respond to the chronic 
distress and concern about a changing climate for their family, or it could be people responding after an event such as a bushfire or a flood. What are the mental health um, um, concerns there in a One Health sense? And this kind of also relates to the second um, flagship, which is around sustainable agriculture and environment. So again, in a in a world where where climate change is changing the way that of farms, changing the way that people need to manage their farms and their animals, stocking, destocking at times of crisis, and what impact does that have on people's um, resilience and mental health, and um, and also um, are there technologies that we can help to address those. The third flagship is on digital futures, and this is really about how do we, as a as a university, in remote sensing, in artificial intelligence, growing areas of ICT, how do we bring those areas together and channel them towards helping us um, address opportunities, helping us in our teaching and learning practices, um, how do we deploy them also to areas of importance for end users? And I think, again, one of the critical factors of MANA Institute is that it's about mental health, about deploying digital futures or digital technologies to better open up access to people in remote parts of New South Wales, Australia, to mental health services, to family and friends? How do we enable that through a digital setting? The fourth flagship is, is really around renewable energy zone and emissions reduction, again, environmental. But a big part of the renewable energy zone is about our whole economy and our communities are going to be transitioning. 20, 50 years, we'll be moving from communities and an economy that's based basically around coal, electricity production and power production to communities and an economy that is drawing on renewable energy. That will mean different things to different people. For a person that could be living in a, you know, a coal mining town, it might mean your community is about to face a big change in, in the world. Down. Coal fire power plants will close close down. People will need to go through a change of of um, structure in their industry, in their employment, and this will lead to community um, concern. And we we kind of see this already in our own region here in the New England area, where there are people that are concerned about the impacts of of renewable energy systems coming into the community. So so that and mental health and mental wellness for individuals as well as as community groups uh, on that renewable energy space so i hope that kind of gives people a picture of both of the of the plan itself um, and also the four flagships um, i'll be coming around to schools and hopefully some individual disciplines as well over the coming a month or two to go through these flagships i'd love to sit down with individual groups of people working the unpack what these how they could see themselves in these flagships so um i'll look forward to seeing um you at those conversations as well um thanks miff i'll hand over to you thank you terrific thanks chris and um i think that this this is that description, while slightly disrupted by an unstable connection, is um, exactly what we're trying to do is to look at how do we actually all fit into this. And there's so many ways when we look beyond just the title of the flagship um, itself and into what does mental health and wellbeing mean in these different flagship areas and how our research can contribute and, and that we can start collaborating with different groups and different people than we may have done before. Um, and obviously our in interest in mental health and wellbeing um, as an um, overarching umbrella that people can get involved with. 
So thank you very much for that. That was fantastic. Um, as I said, we have a stellar lineup of um, panelists who can also talk to how they see um, their research fitting and how mental health and wellbeing um, research from their individual perspectives fits with the research enterprise and engagement plan. Um, so we'll go through um, each panelist, and we've also got Dave Schmood, um, who's obviously chair of um, UNE Life, because. Um, whilst we're thinking about mental health in the workplace, UNA Life obviously do all of the broad support for all of our students as well. Um, and um, and Dave can talk to the way in which UNA Life is also engaged with Manor Institute. And so I really wanted to be able to demonstrate across this webinar that it, this is that the way in which we do research, teaching and support is across the university and we don't have to sit in silos and we can work together. So. Um, with that said, I'm going to lean on our um, early career researcher, Mark Rogers, um, to um, be our first panellist to talk through um, the following questions. Um, so um, what I want each of you to focus on is um, how your research relates to Manor Institute and what you've gained from being affiliated with Manor, um, how you see your research um, fitting in with the new enterprise and engagement strategy, and what sorts of opportunities you do see for others at UNE to get involved in Manor Institute from your experience. Um, so to introduce Marg, as I said, she's our early career researcher from the School of Education. So over to you, Marg. Thanks, Mev. That's great. Um, yeah, so my research fits within the child, youth and family stream of the Manor Institute. And I research um, marginalised voices uh, within families and education, especially in regional, rural and remote communities. Um, specifically, I research ways to support the well-being of military and first responder families and also early childhood educators in um, regional, rural and remote communities. A lot of our research-based resources use lived and living experience narratives to co-create free online research-based storybooks um, and modules to support children from families, these families, um, and they experience stresses like ongoing changes that Chris was talking about, um, frequent relocations, transitions, times of parents working away, parents' um, work-related injuries, like work-related, um, you know, really relevant for our, our theme today of world mental health, that work-related issues. So they can be physical and or mental health. Um, and they also are dealing with the changes that that brings into the family their family life. So my experiences with MANA have really been career changing. I feel like I've found my people. Um, I've always been one of those um, who don't quite fit into any of the boxes. I'm not quite education, but I'm not quite mental health and I'm not quite well-being, but I'm I'm not quite, um, you know, the physical health. So it's been really lovely to be able to work with other people that don't sort of fit anywhere either, but they fit under MANA. Um, it's given me the space and the support to research ref and reflect on my research and learn more about the skills of being a, a good researcher. Um, I've worked with really amazing people who are at the peak of their careers and are able to share their experiences very freely and very generously. Um, and I've also just had the space to go to think about like where next and how could I strengthen this and how could I connect with people who will help me take me here with my research? Um, and how can I reach out to different communities? I've felt very nurtured every step of the way. And I've always felt like I could approach people to say, hey, I've seen that you do this. How could I do that or do something a bit different? I've been able to connect with multidisciplinary teams, um, which has really changed my projects um, and really nurtured and strengthened them. So, for example, I was able to connect and work with um, a digital health machine vision technologist um, who I didn't even know what that meant. And then I was able to work with them to really make um, the resources that we have more effective and to address some of the feedback that the communities had given us about the accessibility and the usability of the resources. Um, so from my perspective, I um, see MANA Institute fitting in with the new research strategies in, in terms of One Health, definitely um, we've got this remarkable opportunity to focus on supporting the health of 
um, regional, rural and remote communities and people um, using holistic approaches. And, um, you know, my my big thing is early intervention. You know, if we can just get in there early and support these, um, these, these communities, then a lot of the services won't be needed, um, even though we want them there. Um, also digital futures. Um, I think, you know, for the cohort that I work with, they're very mobile. They don't particularly want physical resources. They actually want digital ones that can go and they can be downloaded and contextualised for wherever they are, whenever they are and, and however they want it to be. And that might change over time. Um, so I really think that uh, that can be, um, you know, really empowering. And so for the families, I would even argue um, that they need to have one doctor that they start with and that that moves with them, you know, and they have this digital health and and one counselor and 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 one social worker that that is case managed and they can use them wherever they are in Australia or in their overseas posting. Um, so that that person, they really build up um, those relationships. And I think you know Mana could be leading the way on that uh, and UNE can be because we've got all all of the elements to bring that together. Um, and I think that, you know, if you are thinking about joining MANA and you're in UNE, just do it. Uh, you won't regret it. And uh, and I think you'll also find your people as well and you'll be able to, um, you know, really engage in some meaningful research. Thanks so much, Marg. And I love the find your people <laughs> part of that. Um, I think we all we all thrive when we find our people. Um, and so that's a really nice um, way of articulating your experience with MANA, um, particularly as a dedicated early career researcher with us. So thank you so much. Um, so moving on to Sarah Wayland. So Sarah is in the School of Health and is the MANA Institute mid-career researcher. Um, so each of the universities um, had to... Um, paid positions, if you like, uh, only a very small portion of time. Um, and Marg and Sarah are out too. So over to you, Sarah. Thanks, Miff. Um, really lovely to be here today. Um, and also considering the event that we're running externally this evening in Armadale, talking about bringing the community together and priority setting uh, to make sure that we're truly listening to people's voices. I think that when I reflect um, on the fact that I've been involved with MANA even before it was called MANA, um, I, in, in terms of thinking about uh, how my research has gained opportunities by being affiliated with MANA is that whilst it's very easy to sometimes reflect on that when you're tidying up your resume or you're thinking about the publications that you've had, is that there's often a story behind that story of the track record. And a lot of that goes to what Marg was talking about in terms of connection and belonging. I think that um, being an academic um, in the current higher education system is um, a lot of competition rather than collaboration. Whereas MANA is founded on those true aspects of collaborative engagement with community for community. So I think what I've gained from being with MANA is the usual kind of things that you will see when you engage with a research institute in terms of an increase in grant opportunities, increase in success, more papers, more broader collaborations, but a better understanding of what other regional universities are doing, the ways in which we can take our research and truly consider what it means to partner with community rather than um, asking community to come to us we go to them. But I also think it's about ensuring that our research consistently has knowledge translation aspects and is fit for purpose. I think the biggest thing that I've learned from MANA is to really think about the ways in which I need to set aside my assumptions about what regional, rural um, and remote communities might need and recognise that each community is its own little system and that we need to embed that time to understand the system before we start to even consider what's the best approach, what's the question we're trying to solve here, and how do we make sure that we have people around the table that are the right people, not just the loudest voices. In terms of my work with MANA, um, I've primarily been involved um, in the suicide um, prevention and distress stream. In that space, we've been able to publish the Out of the City report, We've also been able to really partner with both some group of eight universities, regional universities and community partners 
to think about how we can solve some complex and wicked problems in community. I think it's just a repetitive focus of continually, continually collaborating and seeing where the need takes us and then addressing the ways in which we can collaborate together to solve those issues. I think in terms of the work that um, Chris really beautifully articulated in terms of uh, the UNE um, research engagement plan, I know that I've missed another E, enterprise, um, is that the plan talks about what we can expect from the work that we do, but how we can look across ways across our university and think about how we're all doing very similar work for the community, yet we're coming at it from different lenses. I think having those flagships that allow us to see where we fit and where those opportunities are means that the pre-work that's already been done by MANA allows us to really keenly see, like for myself, that that One Health approach and the digital futures focus um, really cements to me that UNE is the place to be in terms of the research that I like to do for communities around suicide distress, trauma, and dealing with those environmental, external and internal factors that impact people's health and well-being. I think just to finish up, that one of the key areas that I've seen the way in which MANA has been able to help me in my role is not necessarily about my profile and moving forwards, but to provide opportunities for people in my teaching teams, in my research teams, in the roles that I've been seconded into, because it allows me to offer mentoring to other people that might not have been able to be given mentoring to connect people outside of UNE to other universities to hear what they're doing and conversely those universities sharing back with us so that we strengthen that network as well as thinking about how all of this work trickles down to student experience. So the Healthy Campus initiative that's been run by UNE Life is being evaluated by MANA and it proposes an idea of a whole of university approach to um, good health and wellbeing. And I think anything that we do for ourselves as academics or professional staff will impact the ways in which we meet the students that are coming up, coming to us for learning. So I think I would really encourage people to not just think about what is this going to do for my track record, but how will it shape all of the balanced opportunities that we have as academics? So thanks, Miff. Thanks so much, Sarah. Um, and yeah, fantastic summaries by both of the people who are most involved in MANA. Um, so I'm expecting absolutely the same from all the rest of our panel members. <laughs> um, just to like, uh, calm all your fears about um, how much you can talk to the nuance of MANA. Um, but it, it, regardless of how much engagement you've had with MANA or otherwise, you've all in some way put your hands up to be connected with MANA and that's why it's so important that we're um, having this broad conversation. Um, so I'd like to um, hand now to Stuart Walk, who's in the School of Medicine, um, to talk to his experience with MANA Institute. Thanks, Stuart. That's okay. You probably saw the slightly panicked expression going, oh, crap, I'm next. Um, so I should probably start very quickly with um, a comment that I have just returned from two months in the UK and um, Ireland. I'm still jet lagged. Um, so bear with me if my fuzziness comes across a little bit. I haven't particularly prepared um, anything. So I'll just focus on the three general questions Miff posed to us. Um, and the theme I want to pick on, and I'll, I'll um, use some of the words that Marg used, but change them slightly. So Marg spoke about fa found my people. And I think the interesting thing to focus on, and I'll use the word family, um, is that the opportunity for MANA and being involved in MANA is to actually find your family um, or to find your people, as Marg put it. My work is around intellectual disability um, and then looking at ageing of people with intellectual disability in the intersection with mental health and rurality. That is um, technically classed as niche. Um, there's not a lot of people in that area. And so finding your family was very difficult for me. Um, Miff and I have a background in terms of the collaborative research network, the CRN, going back to 2013. Um, and that had a similar sort of role for me in terms of having peers and collaborators to bounce ideas off. Many of us were not in that disability area, 
but it was an opportunity to, I guess, find some peers and support. And what I love about Mana is this opportunity for people to get together um, and to actually think about where their research sits. And then and this is tying in, I guess, to some of the ideas about the REAP, because I can't remember what REAP stands for, so I'll call it REAP, um, is how we actually intersect across those four areas. And One Health is a really obvious one, um, I guess, in terms of mental health. However, if you're looking into sustainable agriculture, and I'm going to put my disability hat on for a second, you know, there's issues around workforce, and we've got lots of people with disabilities who are underemployed, and there is then opportunities through digital futures to be looking at how we can use um, technology to support people with disabilities to engage more in the agricultural sector. And so there's all these intersections across there, and I think Mana's perfectly positioned to pull a lot of those together. I think one of the issues... Um, of getting involved in MANA yeah, and the opportunities that arise from that is, and this is going back to the family idea, not everyone fulfills the same role within a family. Everyone has slightly different aspects, but you don't see necessarily what everyone else does. And sometimes we get caught in our bubble and it is really useful to step back and look beyond the bubble and how we actually use the expertise of everyone else to actually come together and actually have more than what we were just contributing ourselves. Um, I think you know the, those four areas in terms of the REAP are really useful for us to focus going forward and where MANA can bring together those people um, through the different perspectives. And so we're trying to bring together people from across the university who might sit in separate faculties and separate schools, but each of them bring different perspectives and different ideas. Um, I'm quite conscious of the time, I won't go for too much longer, but my Final comment is we don't recognize our local experience very well. And we need to get better at integrating across the university and pulling everyone together. When I was in, um, so I was in Trinity College in Dublin um, and I was talking with them about issues that they were facing. And then I went to Edinburgh University and I was talking with issues they were facing and they were the same things. And what I found fascinating was that no one in the UK was talking to each other about these same issues. So we we're actually putting together a grant, which is going to be a five country um, collaboration, but it's mostly between UK universities. Australia is going to be pretty peripheral to it, but they weren't talking to each other. And again, this is the, the great um, strength of MANA is pulling together people from different areas so that we can all build on each other's strengths. At the moment, and I mean, historically, we have sort of worked in our own silos and that has been one of our greatest weaknesses. And so something like MANA is awesome in terms of breaking down those silos and enabling us to all work together. And I'll stop because that's my five minutes on the dot. <laughs> Thanks, Stuart, and an amazingly well done given that you're jet lagged and we appreciate you coming in um, for, straight from overseas. And those examples, those tangible examples are fantastic about it's a, you know, from your point of view with disability across all of the different flagship areas and really clear examples of how um, your niche area actually has huge applicability. So thank you so much for that. Um, we're going to move now to Katrina Dixon from the Business School to talk through her research and how it fits with MANA and the Research Enterprise and Engagement Plan. Thanks, Katrina. Thanks, Miff, and hello, everyone. I have not prepared anything to talk about because partly because I'm very fresh into MANA, but I affiliated with MANA because it totally made sense to me because I actually I've been involved in UNE since I was 17 which is a long time that's since last century and because I did rural science and then I've lived on a farm two hours from Armadale for a lot of my life and so I've lived through those droughts and floods and fires and ongoing issues with climate change and so I know it, and I've also felt the isolation and loneliness that occurs uh, for various reasons. Now, when my children were at primary school, I needed some brain candy, so I did an MBA through UNE and then did a PhD, which is looking at how to create adaptive and transformative learning organisations, and that was in natural resource management agencies. Since then, I've been working as a unit coordinator part-time at the business school in, in management and leadership subjects. And along the way, also became a coach and a holistic counsellor and psychotherapist. So 
alongside my unit coordination duties and writing up some research, I'm also consulting in how to create trauma-informed workplaces, which is really important, um, particularly with a focus on psychosocial hazards as part of the workplace health and safety legislation. The, the research I'm writing up, I guess I'm sort of saying that I am multidisciplinary and I didn't ever really fit in just one school and I still don't. And the research I'm writing up is actually looking at what enabled a community of practice that I studied, which are a whole like 15 people working in invasive species management around Australia, what enabled them to become really effective in the way they learn. And importantly, it's not just the learning that they do, it's the support that they give each other. And I could talk about that more, but I won't. But that was actually part of the School of Psychology that I did that in. So when I saw, when I read about MANA, I thought, well, I'm a really neat fit there because of everything that I've done. The One Health, really like to hear about that. And it it also makes so much sense to me that regional universities collaborate together and are not working, removing duplication, not working at cross purposes and creating the synergies that can occur when people do work together and get beyond that um, competitive aspect, which is an ongoing challenge in universities. So I, if, if you, I don't know if you've got any questions of me um, that you want to add, but I will throw in that the I, I teach units in, I've just finished um, business communication and moving into organisational behaviour and then executive leadership, organisational leadership, which are mainly postgraduate units. But I suppose um, unwittingly or unknowingly or whatever, I see myself as a bit of a gift to those students because of the, the background that I have. I know how to build rapport. I know how to be empathetic because of these additional things that I bring or skills and experience that I bring. And I'd love to see that more, um, those sorts of, that sort of experience and skills ripple out amongst other academics, because I know that it's not always the case because the students tell me. So that is potentially another uh, layer, although it might not be prime, a primary goal of manner, that could be an additional goal of manner is to see some sort of ripple out effect. So I'm going to end that there. And if, if you've got any extra questions for me, I'll give no, it a go. <laughs> That's fantastic, Katrina. And um, we'll, we will definitely um, try and leave enough time for question and answers at the end. Thank you so much. And thank you as a sort of relative newcomer to Mana to um, give that your, um, you know, um, patchwork quilt, I guess, of how you got to be where you are. And, and that's exactly as you're talking to Chris's point about how the research that we do also have to intersect with the teaching that we do and the student experience. Um, so thank you so much for pointing out um, those parts of the puzzle too. Um, and so now we'll move to Neil Smart. So Neil's from Science and Technology. So continuing our theme of moving across the university and um, representation from a variety of different disciplines. Over to you, Neil. Thanks, thanks, Miff. Um, so, so I jotted down the questions. So I'll, I'll go through them one by one. The the first one relates to um, how does my research relate to to the Manor Institute? So I, I should explain what I've spent the last twenty five years doing, I suppose. So I, I've been working with people with fairly advanced chronic disease, so heart disease, diabetes, lung disease, kidney disease. Um, many of these people are towards the end of their life and they recognize this because, um, you know, the, the statistics are freely available for them to look at. So many of them know they're probably entering the last quarter of their last five years or so of their life. Um, and I've used exercise to try and um, improve the, the, the disease condition in those people. Um, 
normally we're not aiming to improve mental health per se. Um, so in somebody with heart disease, we're trying to improve heart function. Somebody with um, diabetes, we're trying to improve blood sugar control. But as a consequence of doing those things, um, one of the things that does improve probably the most is health-related quality of life. And you could imagine that when I first encounter patients that they're actually quite morbid and um, the change over a very short period of time in those people is, is quite stark. And, and being able to um, impact people's lives in that way is, is as you can imagine, quite rewarding. Um, we've I've noticed many interesting things Um about people's approach to mental health, especially those with chronic disease. One of the main thing that most of my patients wanted to know is, are they going to live longer if they if they exercise regularly and and, and do other treatments, and are they going to stay at a hospital? Um, sometimes that question isn't very clear whether whether it actually does prolong life and and, and improves you know their 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 time out of hospital. One of the other things I've really noticed through through do, doing mental health research and and, and also, um, you know, we, being involved with Manor lately is the, the the stark difference between older people and and younger people's mental health, because some some younger people do actually get chronic illnesses, and I've I've noticed that. Um, Older people are a little more accepting because they are towards, you know, the, the more more closer to the end of their life naturally. And younger people actually sort of go through the, you know, the denial anger um, phases be, because they, they they feel like they've kind of been cheated out of some life. So that that's how I'm, my research relates to mental health. Um, as I say, it's not something that that I would normally. Um, mental health isn't the primary thing I'm usually looking at. I'm look, looking to improve some of the, the, you know, the body's processes in managing that disease. But, you know, especially in the, in the um, year or so that I've been involved with Manor, I've noticed that the, the, the one thing that does improve the most and change people's lives the most is, is the impact on quality of life that we can give them through, through helping them. Um, the second part of that question, that, that first question was, what have I gained from MANA? Um, well, I've I've certainly gained access to other researchers, um, other researchers that are doing similar work than I am, May, maybe not directly in, you know, the end stage of life and chronic disease, but certainly how people measure um, changes in mental health is, is an ongoing um item that that you know it, it's constantly evolving and so having access to other researchers who are who are trying to quantify changes in mental health has has been really useful for me i've also been exposed um mainly from mentoring younger researchers look you know giving them feedback on grant applications and things like that I, i've actually learned about new technologies and new new methods to to capture mental health measurements um and but I, I would say overall though it's it's just an, enabled me to build collaborations by by being involved with Manor. Um, the the second thing, the second question that we were sort of asked to sort of comment on is you know is how um, Manor can can um, uh, enable us to uh, address um, the, the flagship components as part of the university's research strategy, um, and. The obvious one of those flagships that's applicable to to people with chronic disease and mental health issues is is the One Health aspect, or the One Health um, flagship. And I think you know Manor has provided a, a vehicle to enhance the um, the holistic treatment of patients. So I, I'm often aware that you know, giving patients exercise, encouraging them to be physically active is going to be really beneficial for them. But there are probably other things that they can do at the same time that are part of the overall jigsaw um, that, that, that can give the optimal change in, in, in mental health in, in those people. And what one of the key things that I've noticed in Armadale is that you know, access to especially specialist care for people with chronic disease is fairly limited 
because sometimes we have visiting specialists in this town, but um, they're not here all the time. There's usually quite a significant waiting list to access um, consultations. And so th this, this rural focus is really important. And I think the other flagship of digital futures is, is extremely relevant um, in, in trying to combat the problems people have with chronic disease in actually seeking you know the the specialist care that they need and and that that doesn't just you know um relate to how quickly they get treatment it also impacts whether they have to travel especially when they're chronically or terminally ill that that's that's a major issue um and also the cost uh, of of accessing this care perhaps you know many people have to go to sydney for instance to access you know care when when they're at the chronic disease stage and so the, the the digital futures is a is a way of actually combating this with things like telehealth and uh, and um, you know and uh, preventing the need to, to travel and unless people actually need specific treatments that can't be done you know in a digital environment. So so I I do think at least two of those flagships are extremely relevant to to, to Manor's work. And then the final question is, what opportunities are there for others to, to become involved in MANA? Well, I, I can only really speak to my own experiences. So I, I think I um, did a workshop recently for postgraduate students and, and gave them some of the, the tips um, based on my experiences on, on how to publish their work. And, and publish their work in, in good places as well that, that have the most impact. I've also, um, I, I regularly mentor um, a, a junior researcher in Manor, and um, I, I've also um, looked at um, and provided feedback and some of the grants that that person's written. Um, but I suppose to answer the question in a more broad sense, I think that... Um, Manor offers an opportunity for other people to access new ideas, um, and I've personally benefited from that, and ways of approaching mental health research. I, I think that um, the, the new information I've received just from mentoring somebody else was actually quite surprising. I got a lot out of mentoring somebody else. Um, perhaps one of the ways or, or the, 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 the thing that I was most important that has benefited me has been that I'm I'm working with a younger person who's far more technologically agile than I am. And, and that's um, really useful for, a, you know, somebody who's, who wasn't brought up with technology and, you know, has to clunk around and find passwords and, and things. And, and, take, and I can get things working eventually, but, but having access to a younger person who can help me with that is, has been really helpful and important to me. So it's kind of been a two way street in regard to the mentorship that I've offered. Um, it's, it's been a great experience and, and I'm really glad, Miff, that you asked me to be involved. So thank you very much. Terrific. Thanks, Neil. And um, having mentored many people in my life and been mentored by others, I think that's one of the most rewarding things that you can participate in. And obviously there is a mentoring scheme through um, MANA. So thanks for pointing that out too, Neil. Um, if you do have a question of any of the panellists, feel free to put it in the um, Q&A. Um, if we don't get time for them in the webinar, we'll definitely get back to you. Um, and Liz will put into the um, chat as well the, um, our website if you don't have it, um, although actually it's not in the background. But anyway, if you, if you do um, uh, Google Manor Institute, you will come to us. Um, but to finish off our panel, we have Dave Schmood. And so this is a bit of a shift because obviously, as you all know, Dave is not a researcher, um, <laughs> but he plays an important, very important role at UNE in terms of student support and the way in which holistically we support students through um, UNE life. So over to you, Dave. Thanks, Miff, and, and, and thank you very much for the Im invitation to be part of the, the panel. Um, our, our relationship, as we said, I'm, I'm the CEO of UNE Life, which looks after the co-curricular space uh, within our, our students. And, and that, of course, is broad. And uh, one of the key components of that is sport at UNE, which has um, a huge, huge engagement from our, our students and staff and, and, and broader, uh, I should say, wider uh, community here. Um, and with us uh, back in October, so it's quite timely. Well, um, today's Mental Health Day International. Tomorrow is our first anniversary for the UNE Healthy Campus. 
campus program. So this initiative started a year ago and it bases off um, uh, the uh, World International, uh, sorry, I should say the International University Sport uh, Body, which is FISU, which came up with a, uh, a program and an initiative called Healthy Campus. And we took it about a year ago and, and shook it up and, and changed it a little bit and very much targeted towards, um, particularly for this initiative and partnership with Manor around staff. And the program was very much aligned to working out of um, to to improve health outcomes, both mental, physical and social health. And on the back of those who would know UNE being a couple of years of COVID, then a, a year of tornado and some engagement or also so some, some disruption here, I suppose, with staff. Particularly, we found that um, that health was was one of one of the things that the university really needed to prioritise. So, what we did was with a manner we offered at Sport UNE a, a program which um, gave a uh, UNE staff six month free use of the sports facilities and health facilities, which is a gym, um, fitness classes, and and, and a, a swimming pool. But it enabled us then to to run a six month research pro program which could quantify that. So um, the program really directly aligns with with the research priorities of, of the Manor Institute, particularly as I said, within health and well being and and community engagement. And I know Sarah's event and or Manor's event tonight. I'm really looking forward to, and I think that's a, a wonderful initiative. Um, but our, our collaboration with Manor was focusing on evaluating the effectiveness of the, the UNE Healthy Campus Initiative, particularly through the measurable health outcomes. And that's one of the things with participation, um, engagement and, and behavioural change. I know there's a lot of people who may start um, doing exercise and wanting to do exercise, but to make it a habit and continually, uh, you know, prioritising your physical health and, and and what benefits can that transcribe to mental health, um, particularly for our, our staff here. Um, so I think the the association was incredibly valuable and something that we gained huge um, um, uh, insights with. And I think collaborating and quantifying um, with the, um, the program uh, for Manor, I think, really gave the, the program credibility. And I think, you know, just ha having that re reputation for, for a health initiative like um, the Healthy Campus with Manor gave it incredible credibility, particularly we had a lot of interest from Unisport Australia, which is the national peak body that are very keen on on the results, of course, and we're keen to to con contribute financially to the Institute. Um, and then there's this, of most recently yesterday, um, I'm off to India in a couple of weeks and I'm meeting with a couple of universities and, and just through discussions and collaboration internationally, um, they are very interested in in, in, in the work that um, um, Emana is doing. So this is the first time Miff has heard this, so she's probably uh, excited but surprised going, what the hell are you talking about, Dave? But I think this is really um, showing, I think, the the opportunity for collaboration. And even just listening to Neil here, my head is, is running, sort of thinking, I need to talk again to Neil. So um, I think the bringing... Um, you know, as such a group together like this, but I think as, uh, you know, as Mark said, to find your people and, and Stuart has talked about, I, I think the um, collaboration, particularly for regional and rural universities is inc incredibly valuable. Um, but what it's done for us um, uh, of adapting an international program, what it's given is is incredible uh, credibility for us to take it on, on a broader stage. So thank you, Miff. Fabulous. Thanks, Dave. And I think it's so important to, um, and, and what the whole panel have really brought up is the way in which so many things intersect and we get so busy sitting in our office or just talking to the same people that we always talk to that we get into a bit of groupthink, whereas when we start to think more broadly, um, we can see how um, our work fits um, across a whole spectrum. And so for those who aren't um, yet involved in Manor Institute, um, the website is in the chat, so you can go have a look at our research streams. We have we currently have five research streams, some of which have been mentioned um, amongst our panellists. Um, so the, the streams are child, youth and family, physical health, health and wellbeing in later life, 
distress and suicide prevention and healthy people, healthy planet. And I think even just naming those without having to go into any detail, you can see how close how closely they align um, across the four areas of the research enterprise and engagement plan that UNE um, has and is getting behind. And so there are ways in which when we start to actually talk through, um, we can see that it's much broader than um, you know, almost every panellist started with saying, you know, my research fits with one health, but when I look at this, this and this, it, and, and you know, Stuart gave us a really fantastic example of operationalising that. So I think um, to summarise, the, the key message for me from everybody was about um, when, you, when you hear other people's points of view or other people's research or other people's methodologies, you actually realise that there's more you can learn and there's ways in which you can collaborate and there's ways in which you can share. Um, and I think that's a really important um, part of MANA. It's really easy, I think, in regional universities to feel like there's only the person next door, but there's actually a whole network of people. And the more that we grow those networks, um, the more that we grow as people. Um, and so to use, again, Mark's, Mark's terminology about finding my people um, and, and connecting across the community. So not connecting just across the UNE community, but connecting more broadly than UNE, um, but in disciplines outside of our own. And um, it's really important, I think, to, um, you know, whilst we're in, often in disciplinary groups because we teach together, it doesn't mean our research fits together and the person that you teach with might do very different research, but yet somebody in a different faculty might actually be the person that you're going to have the most engaging conversations with, the most intellectually stimulating, and their connections might be more important to you in terms of building your research career. And I think um, it's that that piece, I think it was you, Stuart, that talked about like when you put all your pieces together, it sounds a bit niche, um, but actually your niche like bumps up against somebody else's niche and then suddenly you realise that you're kind of that bit in the Venn diagram where you can really value add to each other. Um, and I think that's what we've heard across all of the panellists today. What Manor Institute does is really help facilitate that. So it's really hard when we're busy with teaching and we're busy with administration to remember to have these conversations that are really engaging and enlightening and inspiring and, and remind us why we got into being researchers, get why we got into academia, is to solve some of these really complex challenges, is to think about the questions that the community have about you know, the pressures on them and, and to envisage a better future. And that's really what mental health and wellbeing is about, is, is feeling that there is a better future and working towards um, ways to um, yeah, improve the wellbeing and quality across life and, uh, and certainly across those four flagship areas. So um, I hope that those of you who have participated in the webinar or view it later um, have had some ideas about how and why you might get involved. Um, and particularly thinking about the different ways that we do things. So obviously um, there's webinars, there's newsletters, there's lots of information we push out. But what we really want to do is encourage you to come in um, the front door and then start to make some of those connections. Um, the event that some people have mentioned um, is our Armadale Town Hall tonight. Um, so those of you who are located in Armadale um, on this World Mental Health Day, there is a town hall event tonight, which is really about hearing from the community about what the biggest pressures and challenges are from a community perspective um, so that we're being guided by our local community in the research priorities that we fit. And this is the first of the town hall events for across the run network. Um, so it's a bit of a try <laughs> try out um, in Armadale. Thanks, Armadale. Um, but if, you, if you're not already signed up to come along to that, we'd, we'd love you um, to, to join us tonight at the town hall. And Liz has put the information in the chat about that. Um, so unfortunately, because we've spent so much time hearing from our lovely panellists, we are at the top of the hour. And um, so I thank you so much, um, everyone, for joining us. And yeah, please feel free to reach out either to via Manor Institute directly directly um, or through any of our panellists about their experience um, with engagement with Manor Institute. Um, so thanks so much and thanks, Chris, also for telling us a bit more about the Enterprise and Engagement Plan and how we can envisage um, yeah, a new life into our research at UNE. It will pay off for all of us in the long term, individually and collectively. So thank you very much.